just got back from a run and Mika's just called me into Erica to try and make a decision on how high the sofa is. We've got some bits of wood and a bit of cardboard mocked up for the floor. A box and a cushion and the decision is one cushion, two cushions, no cushions. I'm going for one cushion is the right height. So we've measured that and I think that is how high our sofa is going to go. That impacts how deep it goes and how high the back is. It turns out that designing a sofa takes a lot more thought than you might think. You've just seen a little snippet of the design process of the sofa. Whilst this footage of us building the base is running, let me tell you that by the time we started the construction you see here, a surprising amount of time and effort had already gone into the sofa, of which the height test you just saw formed only a tiny part. We particularly found ourselves stuck in a loop trying to specify the timber we wanted to use, and whilst we had pages of sketches saying how the sofa might be constructed, Mick couldn't draw a detailed design until we'd settled on the timber dimensions, and we kept being thwarted by a lack of availability every time we thought we'd made a decision. Once we finally had the timber in hand, we didn't want to lose any more time to design work. So we decided to just start building and see what happened. Even though we're a long way from doing the other preliminary work, like putting some insulation on the ceiling and uh, carpet on the walls, we've started on the bed whilst we wait materials for the rest of the things. And excitingly, that is the first part of the bed structure made. So there's going to be a piece coming across here, like that. This is going to sit on top of it. And that's going to sit on top of that. Now the question is, are we square in all corners? That's me from the floor, just to see if we're uh, okay. with the same at each end. At least it's zero. Rain then stopped play, as it did repeatedly over this couple of days. We got back to it each time the rain stopped, and in this footage you see us making the front support of the sofa base. I've obviously considerably foreshortened the process in the footage, and what I've not shown is that we would cut a couple of pieces of wood, glue and screw them together, then take it to Erica to check it and measure the next piece. I've also not shown the cutting of the wood because I was too lazy to keep moving the camera mount and I didn't film the drilling of the pocket holes, except for a couple we suddenly realised we needed part way through construction, which is what you can see me doing right now. Incidentally, I'm really pleased we impulsively bought some extra clamps a couple of weeks ago because it turns out that a good collection of clamps is a valuable asset in a project like this. What we have there is the back support of the base of the bed and the front support. You would be right in thinking that the back is longer, um, there is a reason for that. And hopefully we got our measurements right and the back and the front are both the same height even though the back is up on the original vehicle height and the front is down in the trough. After more discussion and another bit of careful measuring, we cut some more wood, drilled some more pocket holes and set about gluing and screwing the cross pieces that were going to hold together the front and back supports of the sofa. And that is the main part of the bed frame. A couple more cross supports to put in. What, what's the width that you're getting there? 600 mil. In every place? Yeah. I think we might be able to give ourselves a pat on the back for that. Six. 
nine. We're one mil short on We're the length. Short, oh, failure. Rip it all Three. up and start again. Obviously, we didn't rip it all up and start again for the sake of one millimetre. Instead, we put in a couple of cross supports, one in the middle at the top, even though we weren't sure there was any merit in that one, and one in the only location at the bottom where the front and the back sit at the same height, outside of the trough. Getting there, it's now connected at the bottom at the far end, and we've got a piece across the middle. We weren't sure if we needed that, decided to throw it in. We thought at this point that next we were going to work on the integrated boxing in of the wheel arch, but instead we got started on the next layer of the structure, that being the slats that would form the base of the sofa and also the slide out to form the wider base of the bed. I'll just slow this bit down so you can appreciate me losing control of the tape measure and having it slice my finger. Once we'd finished this frame, we very nearly went straight on to cutting the hardboard to line the bottom of it, but just as we were about to put saw to wood, we thought it might be wise to just offer the frame up to the bed to check that we'd made it the right size. So good job we did that. And now we're just going to adjust that piece we just made, and this time we're going to make it the right size. And there we have take two, which hopefully this time will fit. That looks better. It now is the right size at the back so it can hinge up. So next we're going to put a piece of hardboard on the back of this so that the sliding slats won't all drop down when they're pulled forward. It's only as I've watched back that last snippet of footage that I've realised that we didn't need the hardboard for that reason because the middle support we'd put on the base of the sofa would have performed the same job. The importance of the hardboard is actually to hold the sliding slats when lifting the top of the sofa as a lid to access the storage below. We've now put the frame that we've just made, along with a piece of hardboard inside of it, onto the base. And the reason we've made it like this is so that the top of the bed will lift up. So that will be on a hinge and will lift up so that we can access the storage at that end and the electrical gubbins and stuff at this end. We've just realised, though, that... We've, we've come across a little flaw in our uh, measurements that we took into account the um, depth of this wood and how much gap we needed at the back in order to hinge that up so that it wouldn't foul on anything. But what we didn't take into account when we were making it this afternoon, although we had previously and then forgotten, is the depth of the slats. And because we've actually got a gap at the back here, that's not a problem most of the way along. It only becomes a problem just here. So we're going to have to come up with a little way around that so that when we lift the bed up, we're not stuck at 45 degrees because the slats have hit the back. It does only affect two slats, so we're just going to have to modify those two slats to make them shaped or shorter or something. We finished that day's work by cutting the slats to length with Nick marking the cut mark for each one in turn for me to take just out of sight of the camera to cut. Once they were all cut, we got a couple of shims and laid them out to check we were happy with the spacing. You may have noticed that at the start of this task, I discovered the time-lapse setting on my phone, so there are no longer any sound effects in the background, but the coverage of what we're doing is much more succinct. We just realised another little flaw in our design. This bar here is going to be the bar that's attached to the sliding slats on the bed, and we expect it to be the same depth of wood as this one, 28mm. The problem with that is that once the fixed slats are down, if it's 28mm, it's going to be absolutely wedged in there so it's not going to slide. 
it just so happened that we had the right length of a 25 by 25 left over from some project goodness knows back when um, so we've just cut that down the three mil makes all the difference we also realised about this point that we should have affixed the hardboard shiny side inside so the bar would slide more easily. It was late in the day by then so we convinced ourselves it would be okay and called it a day. The next morning we took the trouble to turn it over, a good call as it only took a few minutes. Then it was back to the slats. We got another production line running with Mick marking the drill line for each of the slats and with me drilling the pilot holes. I then used the saw to chamfer the back end of each of the sliding slats and finally applied a countersink to each of the pilot holes before we started screwing them down. Again we used the shim to make sure that the spacing was right and as we screwed them all down we were eager to get to the last one so we could marvel at the sliding masterpiece we had so carefully created. Having put the bed base together, we found that we had a bit of a problem and it wouldn't slide because the slats were too tight against the sliders. So we're just going round, taking the slats back off and trying little washers in between the fixed slats at the front end and the moving slats at the back end and hoping that's going to give just enough standoff to allow it to slide. We'd originally chamfered only the back ends of the sliding slats, but we now realised we needed to do the same to the front end of the fixed slats, so whilst we had them back off, we did that. And we have a sofa. We had to make the height of the sofa as it is, even though we did lots of calculations, it ended up as that height because we needed to clear the wheel arch. Our intention was to put a 10 centimetre cushioned mattress on there, and we're now wondering if that's going to then give enough headroom. Bear in mind we haven't got the insulation and the, the liner up there. Neither of us is tall. We're not sure how much headroom that's going to give us. But the height had to be what it is, so there's not much we can do about that other than going for a thinner mattress. And now if Mick gets up and gets the other end, we might be able to demonstrate that this does in fact slide out. We do need a couple of guide rails so that it slides, uh, it doesn't go on the squint as we pull it out and push it back and we also need some legs um, along this side to make it into the bed and then it will slide back. As I say we do need to put a guide rail in because at the moment as you can see that's gone in wonky and Nick will have to push from his end to bring it back level Indeed. and one of the reasons we've constructed it like that is that this entire section will hinge up we haven't got the hinge yet so that will hinge up to give access to the underside we subsequently added a supplementary structure to the base to enable us to box in and insulate the wheel arch. As you can also see in this photo, there's been some carpeting of walls too, but more of that in the next video.